Hi everybody, uh, this is David Henty. I'm, I'm just going to introduce this session. Um, I'll just type in, you should be able to, as you see I'm speaking, you should be able to hear me. Hopefully people can, can hear me. Um, so this is um, part of a regular series of, of Archer, virtual tutorials or webinars. Uh, this is going to have a slightly different format. We normally just run a, a, a sort of one hour session with question and answer, which we typically do at 3 p.m. But what we're going to do here is we're going to do two sessions um, on Wednesday afternoons. Um, so we're starting a bit earlier. So one today and one in two weeks' time. And Rupert Nash is going to talk about um, C++. So he's going to do a couple of lectures uh, with a gap in the middle just to give you time to, uh, to digest things. I'm sure Rupert will give us the details. Just to give you some background, um, I mean, it says it all in, in the in the sort of praise but the idea here is really to introduce C++ to people who, A, maybe don't know much about it. They may be C programmers, but don't know much about it. But B, really covering those areas which are relevant to computational science. Um, I mean, I'm a very old style C++, a C programmer, apologies. And um, I always feel I should learn some C++, but I'm a bit daunted when I see how big the standard is. So um, one of the reasons I, I uh, asked um, or Rupert volunteered actually to do this session was to try and give some pointers of the kind of areas of C++ which are useful for computational scientists and also therefore to point you at the areas of the standard that you might like to learn a bit more about. So that's all the preamble I had to give. I'll now pass over to, to Rupert and get out your way. So uh, thanks David. I hope everyone can hear me and you should be able to see me shortly. Uh, uh, collaborates, tells me this is working. So yeah, like David said, this is based on some material I've given uh, as our MSc program, and it's basically trying to give the briefest overview of C++ uh, such that uh, someone who is already a decent C programmer can do something useful in C++ uh, in terms of understanding a program that they've maybe got or maybe writing something afresh uh, for a project they're working on. And um, yeah, as David said as well, I'm very happy to get questions uh, at any point. Um, like he said, if you stick it in the chat window, it will bing at me and I will definitely see that. You can also raise your hand, which will flag you uh, to me as well. <coughs> uh, right, so yeah, I'm just gonna get cracking. So uh, yeah, a few references in case you want to um, follow up on any of these things. So uh, um, there's a list of sort of textbooks there that's very useful, uh, I've, I've found. But the best uh, sort of online reference that I found is the website CPP Reference. Um, uh, it is extremely good uh, and thorough uh, in terms of explaining what's going on. but it does kind of assume you basically know what you're doing. So uh, maybe it's a resource for when you've got a bit more experience, I don't know. The other book I really, really like is the Scott Myers book, Effective Modern C++. Um, so kind of once you know the basics of using C++, I would say this is the the one book that maybe you want to look at to sort of teach you uh, sort of further, further techniques and rules of thumb for writing more correct, more maintainable uh, code. And of course, there's always Stack Overflow as well, but um, like anything on the internet, it's full of um, people who don't really know what they're talking about. Um, yeah, so David said he was a bit intimidated, perhaps, by the um, by the standards. Uh, it's a bit of a misunderstood monster, you know. Um, uh, they're both very big. The 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 eleven standard is uh, thirteen hundred pages long. The seventeen one is even longer, and no doubt it will get longer again when it comes around to 2020. Um, both made up of many different bits. Uh, so C++ has its sort of C core. It has classes. It has generics. You can do functional programming. There's exceptions. There's this enormous library. Um, it inspires dread in those who do not understand it. So I've noticed people express fear of C++, uh, uh, which I don't think is entirely valid. Um, it can be dangerous. So uh, there's a famous ish quote from Bjarne Struestrup, who is the sort of original uh, designer of C++, said, uh, C makes it easy to shoot yourself in the foot, 
and C++ makes it harder, but when you do do it, it will blow your whole leg off. Um, so there's a bit of truth in all of these things. Um, but a sort of more amusing quote is that it, see, it's like an octopus made by nailing legs onto a dog. Um, but there, there is a little bit of truth to that, I would say. But the, the, the thing is, you don't have to use every feature of the language in every single program. You can cut off a few of those extra legs so you have the right dog for your problem. Um, so sort of the philosophy of the language is really that it's to be a general purpose thing. And it's very flexible by allowing um, you, the developer, to build your own abstractions, as well as providing a whole load of uh, abstractions through its um, standard library. And while doing this, it always is targeting uh, good performance which is, and efficiency, which is very important for the sort of HPC numerical computing community. Um, and the, the sort of uh, philosophy they have is that you only pay for what you use. So if you don't need uh, the virtual functions, uh, you don't pay any overhead if you don't use them. Um, and the other thing uh, is maybe not built into the language, but is certainly the philosophy of the way modern idiomatic programming is to use the type system to express what you mean to do rather than just using ints and floats for everything. Um, so what we want to do here is, um, sorry, this uh, reads a bit like uh, it's ported from an MSC course. Um, so we, we have four, four, four hour long slots in this uh, bit. And so I've picked out a handful of features uh, that the, from the language that you really need in order to write something for a sort of typical HPC community. So sort of the fundamentals are um, references and memory management, uh, function operator overloading, the basics of classes, and the basics of templates. So with that, uh, let's go straight in to the canonical Hello World program that you'll get if you look at uh, any C++ tutorial. So just going to break down, well, first of all, um, this thing does run. If you just copy and paste that into your favorite editor and compile it. Um, and run it, you will indeed get it to say hello world. Um, it's maybe worth pointing out that uh, I have added the use the C11 standard. Um, this program will work with uh, you know, the previous standard from 1998, but in everything that follows, I am going to assume that we are using C11 and that you know how to make your compiler use this uh, mode. Um, you know, this is now uh, seven years old. Um, pretty much any decent compiler will support support that well. Um, if you're using something older, I don't care, right? Um, so what's going on? So we've got a standard C style include, um, except we're including this thing called IO stream. So one thing to note if you're a C programmer, where's like where's the .h? Um, C++ for the standard library headers does not add any file extension, don't know, just the thing. And here we're including the standard library header, which gives us access to um, the IO, the basic IO things as a way to communicate with the file system effectively. And the things we're looking at, so here, this um, STD is the abbreviation for standard, uh, slightly unfortunate in some ways perhaps. And this standard thing is a namespace. So a namespace is basically a way of scoping the names of variables and functions and classes and so on, um, so you don't get name collisions. Um, so it's a bit like a file system has directories, but for the names of objects in your program. And the so-called scope resolution operator, the double colon thing, this lets us access uh, some something that is defined, declared um, inside a namespace. And so that's used uh, twice in this trivial program. Um, this C out thing represents the console output, so it's your standard output stream. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're using the uh, the bitwise left shift operator, so left arrow double, uh, to mean stream insertion. I output the thing on my right to the left hand argument, and then we repeat this with the second one because, of course. Uh, 
the operator has a return value which is just the same stream that you used as your uh, to do the output. And similarly, you can use the right shift operator on a stream that supports reading. So, if, for example, you were to open a file as a stream for reading, you would be able to extract data from it using the right shift operator into a variable. So, the way to remember which way around it is is the the arrows point at the thing that's receiving data. So, uh, all the C programmers can give up on using malloc. So, basically, if you're using um, C++, you should not use malloc and free again. Um, you can, but you shouldn't. Um, instead, you want to use uh, new and delete if you need to directly allocate memory on the heap. Um, so this little tiny example, we're declaring um, a variable x that's a pointer to an integer. We're setting it to the special null pointer um, value, which is equivalent to the standard C null in caps, but has more uh, has better type safety properties because it's an actual uh, keyword representing a value in the language rather than just a macro defined to zero or some other special value for your platform. Then the x, we're assigning x to be a new integer. So we are allocating memory on the heap for an integer and uh, making x point to that. And we um, dereference it and store the value 42. We uh, print the answer, um, the, the value stored in there to the thing. And then we can delete the value. So that's exactly like using malloc and free, except um, we don't have to specify the size of the data to do it because the language knows that an int is um, 32 bytes or 64 bytes, depending on your platform. It's ever so slightly different if you're doing an array. You need to use the square brackets here. So if we want to create a uh, dynamic array of the squares of some integers, um, we can create a new array of integers, uh, five long, putting it in square brackets. Uh, and then we can just you treat it exactly like a standard uh, C array. We do reference, uh, we index into it with the square brackets and we set it to a value. And then you can do use that in some way. And then afterwards you have to delete the memory. You have to free it. And um, note that you need to use the square brackets here to tell the run, tell the language that it is indeed an array of things rather than just uh, a single one. So the square brackets matter here. So um, as well as pointers and values, um, uh, OK, there's a question from David saying, um, what would delete squares do, Which, by which I assume you mean uh, delete with no square brackets? Uh, it would probably cause a segmentation fault and crash the program at runtime. But it's implementation, you know, it's a it's undefined behavior, which means all bets are off. Uh, the uh, uh, the joke is that it could make demons fly out of your nose. Uh, it's allowed to by the standard. Um, but in fact, it will probably just crash your program. Okay, so uh, references. So as well as um, pointers and normal values, C++ has this idea of a reference. So they are like pointers in that uh, they don't contain the thing that's they, they, if you copy them, you don't copy it. Uh, they refer to something. But syntactically, you can treat them exactly like a value. So uh, in this little tiny example, we create a double, a normal variable pi, 3.14. Um, we create a reference to it, uh, uh, the pi reference. And we, we um, attach that to the, the variable that it's referring to, and we can print its value exactly like we would have treated pi. So basically just creating a new name that refers to the same underlying value. And then uh, you know you can de define a function, uh, I love integers, that accepts a single double and that will modify its value. So this is like um, pass by reference uh, instead of pass by value. So we say x, we set x equal to three. So we call this value on pi the raw variable, uh, and then print out the value of pi, it will print indeed three, because we have uh, um, we have affected that um, the pi value. 
you said. So why why might you want to do this and um, so on? So the, the biggest advantage is that the syntax is simpler. You don't have to deal with the ugliness of pointer dereference of time. Um, and also they are safer than pointers. So for example, uh, a reference cannot be null and you can't point it to a new value. So you have to bind it to a value when it is uh, declared. So uh, if we had the, um, the example before where PR is a reference to a double that points to pi, um, if we were to try and reseat that to point at 2 pi, that is an error. The compiler will catch that and complain at you. And you can rely on it being valid unless someone does something very evil. Um, so this little get function that returns a reference to a character, you have a local automatic variable x that's uh, just that single exclamation point, and then you return it. Um, now obviously, what's going to happen is that that um, variable is going to go out of scope as soon as the function returns and be destructed. So uh, uh, using that is uh, doing that is evil and um, will uh, um, crash cause your crash probably or at least be referencing a garbage value. Uh, but most most compilers will warn you about uh, when you're doing this unless you're being very tricksy. So when when do you want to use a reference? Um, well, pretty much all the time until you decide that you really do need a pointer. So, for example, if you have to reset it or you have to interface with um, vanilla C. But then hopefully you can just use the pointers in one small area and encapsulate that uh, for the rest of your program if it's, uh, um, if it's only a small part of what you're doing in your application. Sorry, excuse me. So um, function overloading is something that is used um, everywhere throughout C++. So what this, this is, is you can have um, multiple functions with the same name, but taking different uh, either numbers or types of arguments. Um, and the, 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 so this uh, little example, we've got two sum functions. Um, uh, one accepting two integers and the other accepting two doubles and they return the same type which is just the sum of the two values like you might expect. And when you call sum, uh, at the call site the compiler knows the types of the arguments that you are using and it will try to find the best match through based on some rules from all the candidates with the same name that it's aware of at that point. And it will also try and use any uh, built-in or user-defined conversion rules you've got for, that exist for um, casting values to different types. So, um, got um, some examples of what, what might happen. So, if we've got integers i1, i2, doubles d1, d2, and an unsigned uh, integer 42. So, in the first example, obviously, we've got two integers, so it will know to just call the um, sum with two ints version. And the same if we put a literal int value in um, in there, because in uh, the language defines that literal numbers that you write in without any suffixes or prefixes are ints. So in the third case, we've got uh, integer one and the unsigned two. So the language has built in rules for converting from an unsigned integer to signed int, so it will just automatically select the uh, that overload, and then we've got ones for the double uh, with the doubles that we'll just call the double one. Um, can anyone guess what's going to happen with this uh, penultimate one that I've highlighted? Don't be shy. Which uh, variant will that print? What will that call? Sorry. Yeah, hi Carthy, yeah. Yeah, so um yeah. Uh int will indeed be made 
converted to a double because the, the language promotion rules uh, explicitly say that's a thing you can do. Um, but if it couldn't satisfy uh, the thing, it will complain with an error. Say, the compiler will say something along the lines of no valid overload uh, found, and it will typically list the candidates it found. And for the last one, it will be much the same because there are sta standardized promotion rules for a, a float, so a single precision float, which is that literal uh, with the F, sorry, failing to select. Uh, that will be promoted to a double. So um, it's worth pointing out that in C++, the operators, at least for the non-built-in types, are just functions with slightly odd-looking names. So for example, this uh, one here, operator plus is the name of the function. It accepts uh, uh, two vectors and returns a new vector. Um, and you can then use the natural syntax that you might expect mathematically when manipulating manipulating these with your code. So you can go that C is equal to A plus B, where A and B are some other vectors that you've got here. And we're going to come back and talk about this uh, a bit more later. Um, so people sometimes get a bit upset about this, but um, I, about this overloading, I would say you're being silly because the language already supports overloading. C, uh, sorry, the, the C language already supports overloading for operators because you can add two floats, two doubles, two ints, a float and a double, and they will be converted according to the rules that I just discussed, and no one complains about that. Okay, uh, so objects in C++. So this is really just the, the most basic bit about this. We'll come back and do a bit more about objects um, in the next little part. But basically, um, you can define a class just like you would a struct in C, uh, and you use the keyword class instead. Um, the only real difference is you, the, the visibility of the members of that uh, that you define. Um, so as well, the other biggest difference is, of course, that you uh, can have member functions as well as data members. So here is a, a very, very rough sketch of uh, um, a complex number class. So we declare the class and we give it its name. Uh, then you open the braces and terminate with a brace and a semicolon, just like you would for a struct in C. Then we've got these two keywords, public and private, which are the sort of visibility specifiers. This says who can access these, uh, um, these members. And the public keyword means that anyone can access uh, these. And the private keyword means that only uh, the class itself uh, is able to access these things. Um, so if you want to create one of these, you need to provide what's called a constructor. OK, so in this um, example, we're defining uh, three. Um, I'm just going to talk about the name. The constructor is name is given the same name as the class. Uh, and it can accept either no arguments or as many as you need. Um, so we're providing uh, three overloads, um, two explicitly and one uh, one um, by the default. So the default constructor here accepts no arguments. What we're doing here, we, we're initializing the real and imaginary uh, members of the instance to be, both be zero. So got some slightly odd syntax here that um, you might expect that inside the parentheses, the, the braces, sorry, uh, I had gone something like real equals zero and image equals zero. But instead, I'm initializing them in what's called an initializer list. And this basically sets those values before the function body starts executing. Uh, and for example, if you have reference members of your class, this is the only place that you can set them because you can never um, reseat a reference. Uh, so we just set those components to zero and then does uh, nothing else. In the case that we're initializing from uh, two floating point numbers that specify the, 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 rep, the real imaginary parts, 
we just set those values on there. there. So I said that we are providing a, we're telling the compiler to create a default copy construct for us with this um, statement here. So I need to unpack that for you a bit. So we've talked about what a constructor is. It's the way the code gets executed to um, Ah, there's a question from uh, Jane Clark. Does this have the same semantics as C? Can the complex uh, complex accept any number of arguments, or is it like using void in C? Um, so the default constructor, which is the single, which is, which I've just highlighted, this accepts no arguments. So th this is uh, like you're just having void in there. Does that answer your question? Good. OK, so uh, yes, David. Uh, David's asked if he could put any code he likes inside the function body, uh, like standing to standard out, just called default constructor. Yeah, you can put any code you like in there. Um, yeah, it's just a function in many ways. The only thing that's different from C is that you have access to your uh, your one instance that you're running on. The, I'll talk about that a little more in a second. So this um, this copy constructor thing is the constructor that you use for copying. So if you have one complex number and you want to create a new one from it, uh, this is the piece of code that will be called. And for some of these um, special functions around uh, sort of copying and assigning and so on, the language allows you to specify, um, say, just create the default one for me. And what the compiler will generate for you is uh, something roughly like this. It will accept C, which is a reference to a complex that is constant. Uh, and then it will set the real and imaginary parts of that based on what is uh, already there, because the compiler knows what all the member the data members of your class are, and it will just uh, basically execute the copy com copy constructor for each of those uh, by itself. And you will just use the equals default thing to tell the compiler um, to just do this for us. So now we can um, create um, these numbers. So if we go complex zero, this uh, this is what we'll call the default constructor. We can create the I, the imaginary unit, we uh, create one with just uh, zero real part and one imaginary. And uh, we can copy one there. So if we, that's uh, some trivial case. So actually doing some things. We need to provide um, some of these methods that actually work on these. So in the little declaration I showed before, we had a magnitude uh, member function that returns uh, just a single number. What we obviously want is we want to return the complex magnitude of this thing. I have forgotten to put a square root in that uh, thing. I will add that to my list of uh, bugs. Sorry. Uh, so there should be a square root around there, of course. Um, but what I'm, you're doing is you're computing uh, uh, the square of the real part, adding it to the square of the imaginary part, uh, and returning that value. So what the uh, we're saying with this const part at the top here is we're saying that this function, this member function, is never going to alter the instance it's working on. And this is quite good because this means that if you had a cont complex that is const uh, and we hadn't put that on, then you would not be able to call the magnitude uh, method on it, which uh, would be anything. So you want to add this uh, to your member functions wherever you can. Uh, it's also worth noting that we access the members just by their their name. We don't need to do anything special there. We can treat them exactly like a, a local variable um, in terms of um, naming them. Um, you can also get the pointer to the instance that that function is currently working on. Um, it's usually called the this pointer. So we could write the, that um, magnitude uh, member function stop um, like this instead. So we dereference the this pointer 
get the real member of it, multiply it by itself, and the same for the imaginary. Uh, so you might see this occasionally. Um, in general, it's not the done thing to use the this pointer unless you have to, and there are some cases. So complex numbers, of course, have the usual arithmetic operations, plus, minus, et cetera. And if we want to allow, um, allow our bit of software to uh, use these, we have to provide the operator overloads. So for example, the operator plus, we uh, have to define a function. So note that this isn't part of the class. This is a, an, a, just a regular non-member function uh, uh, called operator plus that accepts uh, two references to complex numbers that it will not modify, and then returns a new complex number, much like you might expect. So uh, inside the function body, we just create a nice new uh, complex. Um, Note that I have used um, curly braces instead of round parentheses here. So this is uh, something that you'll see Kate, uh, quite a lot in C++. In general, uh, uh, there seems to be a, some people like to use this all the time, and some people don't. Uh, and no strong feelings. Uh, but basically, when you're initializing uh, something, you can provide uh, it as in the curly um, brackets, uh, and it will use that as an initializer as well. David is asking, why not declare this thing as operator plus accepting a complex with no qualifiers A and another complex no qualifiers B? Um, so that's a reasonable question. The reason is that you could only use that if your complexes were, if you are willing to make copies in the cases that your complex, the, the local variables that you were calling it with were const. So by accepting the Harvey, I'll come back to you. Sorry, that uh, just uh, so by uh, accepting a reference, we avoid the copies, uh, and by accepting a const reference, we, we can accept uh, a constant. Where we can we can apply this operator to things that are constant. So uh, in C plus plus, it's generally good to stick the const keyword in wherever you can. Um, because this means that the compiler knows that you are not modifying these things and can be more aggressive in its optimization and so on. David, uh, okay. Yes, uh, it is confusing at first, the references versus pointers thing. Okay, so Harvey brings up um, the, the friend issue. So obviously we specified before in our declaration of the complex class that the members real and imaginary were private, which meant that no one except the class could touch them. So there is a special thing. You can declare that something is your friend. So if you declare that uh, some function or other class is your friend, that uh, friend can then touch your private members. Um, I appreciate this is very strong in the innuendo. Um, uh, Harvey is asking, should this be declarable inside the complex class without the friend nonsense? So you could declare operator plus as a member function of the uh, class, and therefore you would not need to mark it as a friend. However, that would not be uh, a good thing to do because adding two things together is symmetric with respect to each other. So this would not be relating the, reflecting the real relationship between these two things. So uh, I think it would be widely accepted that it would be better to define this as a non-member function, but this is getting a bit uh, esoteric, perhaps, for this introductory thing. Um, I think I kind of want to state without proof that this is better. Is that OK, Harvey? Uh, 
Okay, I'm assuming that's okay. Right, um, templates in a nutshell. So um, C++ templates are basically a, a way of doing metaprogramming. So you write a program, that then writes a program. Um, so let's have a nice easy example that we've touched on already. So we've got these two sum overloads, um, one accepting an int, one accepting doubles. Um, you know, and what if we need to add some more types to this, uh, a float and an unsigned, or maybe one of these complexes we've just been dealing with. So this is going to get uh, pretty boring to implement and hard to maintain and ensure that everything's up to date and correct all the time. So instead of that, let's create a template. So you do that with this uh, keyword template, and then you need to provide one or more parameters to your template. Um, here we're providing one parameter that is a, uh, a type. So in a template parameter list, the words class and type name are synonyms for each other. I don't know if there is entirely a preferred one. Um, you'll see both. Uh, just try and be consistent, it doesn't really matter. So we are accepting any type we like T, and then we're declaring a function that is going to accept two Ts and return a new T. And so we just return the sum. And then when you use it later, the compiler will substitute the types that you supply for T and then try to compile the template. So if we call it with uh, two unsigned numbers, it will just work. And the same for um, single precision floats. So um, the, um, the compiler is basically figuring out for us what the T is based on the types of the arguments for us here. So it's, um, you, don't have, you often don't have to explicitly specify what the, the type is when you are using uh, function templates. So as well as function templates, you can define um, a template class. So this is a template that, when instantiated, will uh, produce a class for you. And so let's try and uh, approach something useful like a very simple array class. So it's the same as before. We declare, we start the template declaration um, by using the template keyword. Then inside angle brackets, we list the template arguments. So again, it's just a single type T. Uh, so we're going to call this thing an array, and it's going to have uh, private members of the size and data, which is our pointer to T. And then we're going to provide our public API for accessing it. We have a, a default constructor, a no argument constructor, um, a constructor for if it's got n elements. This special twiddle thing that I'll come and talk about, uh, it's got a member function size that tells you how big it is. And then we have the operator indexing one. And we've got two variants of that. Again, I'll come back to that. So one thing that I find people uh, get a bit confused about is where do you actually implement this? Because typically, you would put your class declarations like this along with any other functions you've got in a header file. And then you would have a .cpp file where you put the actual meat of your code, um, the actual body of these things. But the issue is that templates are not executable code. They tell the compiler how to create that. Uh, so the full definition of the template has to be available to the compiler when, they instant, when it instantiates your template. So that means that typically you put in the header file. So you can either define the functions in place in your sort of class declaration. So like this, we're defining template class array, the public members. Um, the template class members are here. So we're so declaring the, the uh, default constructor. And then we say that we initialize the size to 0 and the data to the null pointer. Uh, Anton asks, can one use more than one template class for a function, say template class T1, class T2? So um, your question is not quite well formed, but I'm not uh, 
um, that that's okay. So what I think you're asking is, can you have a template that accepts more than one parameter? Yes, you can. So exactly like that. So you would go template class T1, T2, uh, and then you use T1 and T2 as your function uh, arguments, say. Or... Okay, good. So uh, yeah, so you can definitely have you can have arbitrarily many uh, up to some probably implementation defined limit. Um, so yeah, so you can either define your functions in place as you uh, define the class, uh, or you can stick them at the end of your header, or sometimes people put them in another file that they then include at the end of their header such that effectively it's uh, equivalent to the same thing. So the sort of boilerplate for doing this out of line definition of um, template class member functions looks like this. So you have, you, it is a template of course, it's a recipe for making a member function. Uh, the member function it's making is the array template class parameterized by the template argument and its constructor. In this case I'm doing for the construct it with a given size. And so you just create the size, set the size member, and then you assign that the data member is a new array of t's of a given size. So when we um, create this class, we acquire some memory. Uh, Harvey asks, what is the scope of the t on this slide? So t is basically a local variable. Uh, if you want to think about it like this, but it it exists at the sort of compile time, the template instantiation time. So when I create an array of ints or something, that will bind t to be an int, and then the compiler will fill it in for us. And then t is uh, not accessible as a name outside the template. Does that make sense? Good. Okay, so we acquired a resource, we acquired some memory uh, when we call when we, the constructor runs, and we need to have some way of not leaking this memory, not wait, letting it uh, go. So typically, a class's destructor is what's going to. Do. So the name of this function is the funny twiddle class name. In this case, it's twiddle array. <coughs> uh, the reason for this slightly insane notation is that twiddle is, uh, from mathematics, the sort of uh, binary negation operator, the complement or whatever. So this is basically the annihilation operator for an array. Uh, so we need to provide an implementation for this. And all this is going to do is it's going to call the delete operator on the, da the data member to release that uh, memory back to the OS. It's quite important to note that you never want to call your constructor explicitly. It's up to the compiler to insert the calls to it at the appropriate time. So times that um, the compiler will arrange for your destructor to be called are when it goes out of scope. Uh, so if you've got a local or automatic variable, when the, uh, the curly, uh, curly uh, braces uh, uh, that contain the definition of it finish, your variable will be destructed. Um, it will also be called when um, when some code calls delete on one of your instances. So for example, if data contained a non a class type, you know, that had its own destructor, this delete statement would arrange to go through every single element of that array calling its destructor for you. And the other time that things are deleted is if they are the if they are data members of that other object and that object is destructed, the compiler will recurse in and destroy all of its data members. Okay, so I'm going to bring bring up a, the sort of the first sort of pattern type approach, um, uh, sort of um, 
design pattern uh, that's used in C++ everywhere. And it's really at the heart of uh, writing sort of modern idiomatic C++. And it's got the slightly uh, odd name of resource allocation is instantiation. Uh, and uh, this is all perhaps better known, well, it's a perhaps more descriptively known as constructor acquires, destructor releases. And what, uh, what it's trying to communicate is that uh, any resource that, you're, that you have, uh, so heap memory in the array case, the, the ownership of that should be tied to the lifetime of an object. Uh, so when the compiler create, when you create one of these objects, you acquire the resource, and when uh, when it's when your object um, is destroyed, uh, your code should ensure that um, the resource is also released. So, for example, here you might uh, have some some method does some simulation with some parameters. We need to create. Uh, a work array based on the problem size. We do apply our initial condition. Uh, we do a whole bunch of time steps on the work array. And then we want to write the output. And we need this to memory to be freed um, once this thing happens. So of course, because array the work array here is a local variable, when we hit the end of this, uh, this function, because it's a local automatic variable, uh, the destructor of the work array will be called and the code that we had on the previous slide will then delete um, delete that memory. And so we won't leak any resources. So one thing that I've not mentioned yet is uh, what do we want to do about copying? So um, if we're dealing with large arrays of numbers, which is fundamentally what um, you know, numerical computing is about, um, we may need to have multiple references to the same data, or we may need to copy it. Um, and we need to think about how we're going to deal with that. So if we wanted to uh, assign array A to array B as a variable, should this do what? Should it create a shallow copy? So basically, we just simply put, copy the pointer across. Uh, then we have to decide who's going to own the data and how we're going to keep track of that. Or we could instead do a deep copy of the data. But of course, that's going to be quite expensive if we're dealing with uh, you know, gigabytes, potentially, of data per array. Maybe we want to disallow um, any implicit copies. So we want to say that a, c a copy just by assigning a variable is not allowed. But we still want to allow that behavior, but only when the user explicitly requests it using perhaps a copy uh, member function. So you do need to think about these things um, and how you want to make resources available to the rest of your program. So something that um, you might want to do quite a lot is uh, compute an array inside some function and then return it to the caller. So for example, if this we have this little function load that just takes a file name and returns an array based on this. So you know, we get the size somehow, and then we allocate, we construct our array of the correct size. We go through and we read from the file name and assign each uh, thing in value. And then we want to return this to some user code, which is going to you know, create one of these from its file name. So what everyone assume is going to happen <coughs> is this. So if we're in the user function, that um, here we're going to call the default constructor and create an empty uh, data array. Then we're going to call this function. This is going to go inside. We're going to go here. We're going to construct one and allocate uh, n n integers. We're going to go through and fill it in as you'd expect. People think, uh, okay, that's going to copy to this temporary value, which is the return value. Then we're going to copy this temp to the actual data, uh, and we're going to have to destroy temp. So um, maybe maybe this did happen in the 90s, OK? But this is not what's going to happen these days. But people are terrified of this. And so instead, they start jumping through loads of hoops. So um, they 
you'll often see people um, returning a pointer. So the load um, thing will uh, return a pointer to an array of integers. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So we have to create uh, our new array. So this is actually going to cause two allocations. Admittedly, one of them is going to be tiny because it's just for the storage for the pointer and the um, the size. But you know, it could get a bit silly if you're uh, doing this a lot. Then inside our loop filling it in, we're going to have to have the slightly ugly pointer syntax uh, to dereference the pointer, then read it in. And then when we're in our user case, uh, we're going to have to remember that we've got a pointer there that we have to handle and clean up. So I do not like this. The other thing people uh, will end doing is they pass the output argument by reference. So at least uh, we're not going to leak memory here. Um, but when we resize, we're probably going to allocate some memory. But if the uh, the value that was passed in was very big and we're only reading a small bit, maybe we're wasting a lot of uh, memory. Who knows? It, it's not a big deal. But the, the main nasty thing is that we have to uh, declare this thing outside the factory function and pass it in. And it's kind of like we're regressing to, regressing to assembly. And the thing is, if we're the user, and we're never going to actually modify this data, just process it in some way. Perhaps we want to declare that that's const, but we can't. Uh, and this maybe will not allow the compiler to be as aggressive in optimizing as we'd like. So something that uh, C++11 introduces is the concept of moving things. So um, you know, it's a pretty simple concept. My, my two-year-old son gets that if you want to get a thing from here to over here, you don't create a new one here based on that and then destroy that one. You just move it. And this is the kind of uh, the recipe for how you would do this. So what, what we're doing is we're just declaring a new constructor. This is called a move constructor. And this uh, double ampersand thing is a so-called R value reference. Uh, I don't want to go into why it's called that. But basically, this is a reference to a thing that's a temporary value. So this is, for example, if you had um, the return value of a function or the result of an expression that creates a new value, this thing that you've created is a, a temporary value that is going to be destroyed by the, uh, by the, the language uh, once you, the assignment has happened. So because it's going to be destroyed, you can mess around with its uh, things that it contains. You can steal its resources. And what you do to it doesn't really matter as long as you leave it in some state that can be validly destructive. So what we're going to do is we're going to steal uh, its data and set our size to equal to the other size. And then we're going to set it as if it was a default constructed um, uh, instance of array, uh, which can be safely deleted uh, uh, as a no-op. So now what happens uh, sort of conceptually is you construct your array. And then when you return to the answer, it's uh, going to a temporary. And then the temporary is just moved into the value you want. And the temporary is destructed, which is a very cheap operation because it should be a not in a, some sort of null state. So. It's also important to say that compilers have been allowed since the C++ 98 standard to do something called copy elision, even when this may have visible side effects to the users. So elision means to sort of uh, delete something. It's allowed to um, basically add a secret argument to your function. And it will alias the return value uh, to this secret argument and construct it directly in place. So I'm sorry, my uh, slide is terrible. It's uh, gone off the bottoms, but it's exactly the same as you would see before. Uh, array data is load. And all it's going to do is uh, um, pass, the pass the argument of the empty data 
in as the secret argument of your function call, and it will do no copies, no moves. It will construct the array exactly once for you. So the kind of point I'm hammering at here is that it is really OK to return complex objects from functions. The compiler is ex extremely good at um, avoiding doing copies. And in fact, this uh, pattern here, uh, where you're returning a named value that you've constructed as a local, from C++ 17 onwards, the compilers are required to do this copy elision. There's no option about it. Sorry, my slides are failing to advance. Ah, well, uh, that means that I uh, finished. Sorry, I uh, think so. That is the end of the first part. Um, going to take an hour's break, and then I'll be back. Um, but I'm, of course, very happy to take any questions that you've got now. So uh, please uh, shout out. You can raise your hand or just type. Uh, David's just confirming back at 4 p.m. Yes, I will be back here probably five, ten minutes before, uh, uh, ready to answer questions. But the session is going to be up and running the whole time. Um, so, yeah, so any, uh, any questions I can answer. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah, okay, so David is asking about auto. Um, I did not explain it. Um, so auto is basically uh, a keyword in the language that says, uh, dear compiler, you should be able to figure this out for me, figure it out. So for example, this, uh, sorry, I'm clicking the wrong place, the, this for auto i equals zero. So Zero in the language is an int, int literal of zero, so the compiler knows that, and so it can infer that the correct value for auto should be int. And this saves an awful lot of typing. I'm going to um, going to talk about auto a bit more uh, in an hour's time, uh, if that's right. Okay, Declan asks if there are any alternatives to rolling your own multi-dimensional array class. It's a common task in a lot of science code and something C++ lacks. Uh, yes, yeah, so the standard library has no multi-dimensional array class. That's a fair criticism for our community. Um, there are a whole bunch of uh, different ones available. Um, there was quite a good discussion on the RSC Slack, if anyone uh, looks on that recently, uh, about that. Actually, I'm not sure if it's recent enough that um, it's still, because you only get the last few thousand messages on there. Um, yeah, um, there's a whole bunch. Uh, ask on C++ Slack or Google. Um, there are plenty of decent ones. Um, you can probably find the one that's right for you there. Jose, um, come back in an hour. We're going to address exactly that point. Um, but because the auto, basically auto is done at compile time. So the compiler looks at the static types of the right-hand side of the declaration and goes, OK, that's an int. Oh, OK, that's some complicated type. OK, and it will uh, put it in for you exactly as if you typed it yourself. Then he has a question about references. OK. <coughs> Uh, David asks, for multiple reference, is it int reference, int ampersand x comma y, as opposed to int star? Um, never do that, David. Never do that, because it's not readable. 
And you also, of course, because it's a reference, you can't declare, you have to seat them to a value when you declare them. So you never do that. Okay. Harvey asks, really I could be incremented beyond the size of an int. Um, yes, I could be incremented beyond the size of an int, but that's a problem that you have using ints. Uh, could you define your question more precisely, please, Harvey? So auto passing has to look at the four loop expressions. No, auto only looks at the declaration. So if you had put, uh, I don't know, if you had auto i equals some function call and that function recalled returned a car, how do you know if you need a long, long, long? Um, well, if you really do need a long, 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 you'd better tell it because it is only looking at the type of the thing on its right hand side. So if you, you, you need to be aware of these things. Well, there are a whole bunch of use cases where you have to use auto. And to be honest, I'm only using auto on these slides to kind of get you used to it and sometimes to save typing. Um, auto is useful, um, but not without its pitfalls. Um, yeah, so if long returned something that was a long, that's fine. Or if you wrote auto i equals zero capital L, uh, that would be fine. <laughs> Lewis asked if the slides are available to download. Uh, they will be. They're not currently yet. Um, I'm going to put the source and the compiled versions on GitHub. Uh, the recording of this will be put onto YouTube in the near future. I don't know where. Okay, so um, I'm going to go and get a cup of tea now, uh, and I will be back at about 10 to 4 for any further questions then, um, and then I will start talking again um, at 4 o'clock. Okay, thanks for your attention, guys. I'm just going to drop off uh, line for a bit.